the 2022 Nobel Prize for Chemistry has been announced. It's quite exciting and also removes the pressure from all the other chemists who thought they might win it and haven't. Did you think you were going to win it? No. <laughs> there were, as usual, three winners. They were awarded the prize for so-called click chemistry and a variation of it which is called bio-orthogonal chemistry. In click chemistry, you take two spring-loaded molecules and you react them with each other very, very efficiently without generating any waste. It's a little bit like taking a, a safety belt in your car and just clicking the two bits together. So that's how, how efficient and, and great these reactions were. There are no traditional demonstrations of click chemistry and our student Chris, our PhD student working with my colleague Neil Thomas has devised specially for you a new click chemistry demonstration. Um, so we're going to be doing a click reaction today and this is a particular um, type of click reaction or a special type of click reaction and the azide we're using will actually only fluoresce once the click reaction has actually proceeded. The three winners were Carolyn Bertozzi, who's in America, Morten Meldal in Denmark and Barry Sharpless, who is also in America. Barry Sharpless is really quite special because he's only the second person ever to win the Nobel Prize for Chemistry twice. Initially, I'm just going to add into this uh, tube here the um, copper sulfate. So this is going to be our catalyst for the reaction. Click chemistry is an area of organic chemistry. It is slightly ill-defined, but what it is, is a way of doing chemical reactions very efficiently and very rapidly. Because it means you can even do these reactions in water, which for us chem chemists is often very, very difficult because water is, is quite reactive itself. So you can do these reactions in water. They're very efficient. You get very good reaction outcomes. And as I said, you, you generate no waste, which is great because we're interested in sustainable, sustainable reactions that don't generate a lot of waste. So you need 1.25 microliters into there. Organic chemists often construct the most beautiful molecules by a whole series of reactions, which are quite slow, the reactions, and between each reaction you have to purify everything because each step just produ may produce a mixture of products and you have to separate the one you want. So in this experiment we're just using the unnatural amino acid um, homopropargylglycine. You have to write that down for me. Yes, it's, it's usually just abbreviated to HPG. So Barry Sharpless's idea was perhaps one could do reactions more like nature, where they went reasonably fast in water, because nature does most of its chemistry in water, reactions which would produce just one product rather than a mixture. And so the key to this was to find reactions that are between molecules that have quite a lot of stored energy. You can imagine the bit like a compressed spring and they release the energy. And the first problem was to find suitable pairs of molecules that would react, that had this stored energy. And both Sharpless and Meldal independently discovered that you could use so-called azides. And then now we're going to be adding the um, azide. And this um, azide probe uh, was developed by the Batozzi group. And as I said earlier, this is a um, fluorogenic probe that will only fluoresce once the reaction has proceeded. So you have a carbon atom here, and the azide group is three nitrogen atoms joined together. And this is very reactive. Azides are used in detonators for explosives, things like that. And they discovered that if you used a copper catalyst, you could get reactions to go very well. It is not the usual copper, the copper 2 plus, like copper sulfate, but it is copper 1, 
which is not very soluble in water. But these reactions go very well in water and there's a whole range of them. We're then going to add um, 7.5 microliters of this um, compound called THPTA, which is just going to act as a um, copper accelerating ligand. So it is a chelating ligand. It's just a telltale sign, really. If you're doing kind of these reactions in a living system, for example, or you want to test the um, uh, yeah, test the reaction completion in ways, for example, in my research, I might uh, use this to test whether a reaction has gone to completion when I can't use standard chemical analytical techniques such as NMR, mass spec, and things like that. Carolyn Bertozzi was particularly interested in biological systems. If you've been watching for a long time, you will have seen our 2008 Nobel Prize video talked about the green fluorescent protein which can be used to label organisms. The problem is what Bertozzi did was to find a way of using the click chemistry to join fluorescent molecules to the outside of cells. The problem with Sharpless's chemistry was that the copper catalyst could poison the organism. You could join the molecule on, but the organism was dead, so you couldn't study its behavior. So if you think of the cells in our body, our human cells, they're a little bit like M&Ms. I couldn't find any M&Ms, so imagine them like Maltesers. You've got the core of your M&M or Malteser, and that is surrounded by a layer of sugar. And the cells in our body look like this as well. You've got the core, and then the cell core is surrounded by a layer of sugar. And this layer of sugars is very important in how the cell interacts with the things around it. So, for example, how it recognizes friends and foes. For example, our immune system recognizes our own cells because of the sugar layer around them. And similarly, pathogens that, that create disease in our body recognize um, and invade cells because of the sugar layer. So it would be really interesting for us to find out more about the sugar layer, to understand more about the immune system and diseases. And this is where Caroline Bertozzi became really interested in click chemistry, because she wanted to be able to image the sugar layer around our cells. And at the time, you could only do this very destructively. So imagine taking a cell, throwing it into a blender, and then looking at the bits of sugar floating, floating around in your smoothie. That obviously is very destructive. So what she wanted to do was take chemistry, take chemical tools, and be able to look at the sugar layer around cells without destroying them. So that's all nicely mixed in there. And so even though we've got all of the um, ingredients, as it were, or the reagents in there, the copper is actually in the incorrect oxidation state to actually act as a catalyst. Um, so I've pre-populated this um, uh, 384 uh, well plate here. Some have water in and some have ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate. And that sodium ascorbate is going to act as the reducing agent to reduce the oxidation state of our copper from copper 2 to copper 1 and therefore the catalytic um, action should be able to proceed. I met Barry Sharpless once in a, uh, at a conference. We had tea together and he produced a huge stream of ideas, some of which were really good, but others we haven't really followed up. He's an enormously inspiring character. Our former colleague John Moses, who has done videos early on in periodic videos on aspirin, for example, is now a professor of click chemistry and used to work with Barry Sharpless. So we've got um, 10 microliters. So in some of these wells, we've got 10 microliters of water already. And in some of them, we've got 10 microliters of a solution of ascorbic acid. So I'm just going to fill up the wells with another 30 microliters. This is a really nice example of excellent chemistry, but chemistry which is useful to humanity because it accelerates the rate at which organic chemists can potentially discover new medicines, new pharmaceutical products. And so it is really in the spirit of the Nobel Prize, which is to do science for the benefit of humanity. Uh, so this is just a UV light box, and this is just going to 
Um, we're going to put it under long wave radiation and it's just going to shine ultraviolet light onto the top of the well plate. So obviously in the wells that I've populated with the sodium ascorbate, conveniently spell the word click, and the ones that um, I've just populated with water obviously don't catalyze the reaction and therefore um, don't fluoresce. So yeah, so the good thing is I can actually spell. <laughs> Chris's supervisor, Neil Thomas, uses click chemistry to activate spider silk. You know, the fibers that are made by spiders. What Neil does is to activate the surface of the spider's silk to put on either fluorescent probes or to put on drug molecules so that it can be used for wound treatment. And he's produced some really nice examples of fluorescent spider silk. And he sent me some nice pictures. Caroline Bertozzi is only the eighth woman to win a Nobel Prize in chemistry. And as far as I'm aware, she's the first member of the LGBT community to, to win a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Um, and this is obviously very important for representation. She explains herself that as an undergraduate and, and PhD student, she faced um, ridicule and sometimes even exclusion um, because of sexism and, and homophobia. So it's really important to, to, to have a strong role model to, to inspire and support the community and, and raise awareness for, for some of these issues. So Bertozzi also discovered that the molecule cyclooctine, this is an alkene in an eight-membered ring, is so strained, has such a lot of energy, that it can do click chemistry without the copper catalyst. And she also coined this phrase, bioconjugate chemistry, which is now very widely used. There are even journals of it. So she's created a whole new field of chemistry. I think the Nobel Prize definitely is still, still a big deal. Um, it is very inspirational to see how far you can get with your research, especially finding applications for your research. And in a way, in, in the sciences and, and in chemistry, Nobel Prize winners are a, a little bit like superstars. Barry Sharpless, in 1970, that's more than 50 years ago, had a serious lab accident when a glass tube exploded in front of him and he wasn't wearing safety glasses and he lost the sight of one eye. And ever since, he has said, there is absolutely no excuse for not wearing safety glasses in the lab. So if there is one message that you get from this video, wear safety glasses in the lab. And if you're not convinced, watch our video where Neil shows why safety glasses are important. In my pocket, I've got this, and this is a real Nobel Prize medal. It's a real Nobel Prize medal made of gold.